Hi there, Paul Ravelli again for the Gnostic Church of Light and our Phenomenal Spirituality series. Today we're going to do the first of three programs on Heidegger's Being and Time. Uh, one of the first things that got me interested in Being and Time was having read Kant's uh, Critique of Pure Reason, where I learned about the a priori and space-time in that process. Uh, and when I started reading uh, uh, Heidegger, uh, I did not realize the, the depth of his involvement in uh, Nazism. Uh, not so much that he was a proactive Nazi, but that he was very much in favor of the Nazi party and pretty much remained so. And I do have a rationalization for this that I'll discuss in a minute. Um, but the first thing I would really like to point out, because I have been reading these uh, phenomenological and uh, German idealists uh, in terms of my own Thelemic philosophy and trying to, you know, put more meat on the bones on, onto what Thelemic philosophy actually is. And the first thing that really jumps at me in this regard is uh, something I think that especially those who um, were that first generation of Thelemites in and around the Moda trials that would eventually create the Caliphate OTO, uh, there was a video that circum... That, that circulated really as a, as a cassette tape and music first. It, it, it became a video later as the internet came into vogue. Um, and this video in the third chapter of Liberal, you could hear Hitler uh, speaking. They, they had Hitler speeches in the background while these verses were being read uh, of the third chapter of Liberal. And you could hear the crowds roaring for him. And... People, some people were appalled, I, I, I'd say more than a few, um, that you, you know, would even intimate that Libra had anything to do with Nazism. And then yet others, of course, would have been very happy for that. Uh, and to this day, we know there's still a strong, um, a, a still a strong fascist nationalist uh, element uh, that has never left American culture and uh, has been at its strongest in the last ooh, easy uh, eight to ten years, but has been with us uh, uh, undercover uh, or, or, you know, underground, so to speak, um, is from before the Internet, and certainly since McCarthyism. We can say that Trumpism is an element of that uh, same uh, fascist movement, uh, the Trumpists being not all that different from the McCarthyists, uh, arguably so or not, uh, I'm not going to you know state that for sure, but certainly we can make some parallels. Now, um, why would Heidegger be pro-Nazi? And as I thought about that, I came to realize one very, very important thing. Um, if you read Heidegger's, not, uh, not his being in time, but if you read his introduction to metaphysics, he's going to talk about history, and we'll talk about it here a little bit, but he's going to talk about history as the measure of being. In other words, no history and the being doesn't exist. And that is vital, so that a lesser culture like... Uh, I don't know, let's say Taiwan, a small, tiny little island country, or um, you know, the Baltic states or something like that in Europe, what's going on now, uh, especially these lesser countries are not really in the zeitgeist of our culture. I'll use a Jungian term here, and Jung is important for Nazi Germany as well, and I'll talk about that in a second. But these lesser countries are not pervading on this planet, so their culture is relatively meaningless, and there, and thus th the lives in that culture are more or less void, at least in terms of Heideggerian metaphysics. 
so that these beings are, are as good as not being because there's no strength in anything they do. Even a, a great heroic star in that culture is not going to be as strong as, say, somebody like a Julius Caesar uh, or, or Alexander the Great, who was part of a major empire and, and therefore has been known throughout the centuries. And, and that's just it. They're forgotten when the country is forgotten. And how many countries have been forgotten over time? And indeed, I'll say I made this note to talk about this a little later, but I, I think uh, I'll, I'll talk about it now just real quick. When a pharaoh was well hated in ancient Egypt, his hieroglyphs on his tombs, etc., these hieroglyphs were erased. All mention of his name was erased um, so that he would not exist. He would not have being. Uh, he, he would be forgotten in time and he would not live the millions of years that were supposed to be that, you know, that was all dependent on his remaining in history. So this idea metaphysically has existed for a long time. And I'll say finally on that, it's interesting that uh, today it was planned that I would do this video because uh, for those seeing this video in a timely way, we know we're in the middle of the uh, Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, we're seeing yet another Hitler figure, another nationalist figure um, emerge, uh, in this time really extending borders. And I will say, uh, different from, because I mentioned McCarthyism and Trumpism, different from these two, um, uh, Putin uh, is uh, the kind of nationalist that is pushing his borders out, like Hitler, where I will not put... Trump or McCarthy or even um, uh, the Chinese uh, fascist dictator nor the uh, North Korean fascist dictator. I will not put them in the same place. Putin is getting a special place in history that seemed Hitler had uniquely carved out for himself. Even Stalin and Lenin and... Uh, Mussolini, these guys don't even own up to those particular two. So, uh, getting past uh, you know any any uh, politics or historical politics, um, let's move into what Heidegger is talking about in being in time. Uh, for Heidegger, especially, but we can say in general, phenomenology is a description of the world as it manifests itself to the human mind. And this is especially uh, in terms of Kant as well. And when I came to contemplate that, um, I also came to that third chapter of Liber Al, uh, verse 75, uh, that says, and that's almost at the very end of the chapter, uh, that says the ending of the words is the word abrahadabra. Um, and the word abrahadabra we might consider to mean uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, Had is the key to the innermost self as abra is being, the self uh, couched in being. Um, for uh, Heidegger, the world being is design. Uh, and he uses that word design, and it's a unique German word that I've seen interpreted, I guess, in a couple of ways. Design being in the world, uh, or as I think more ap appropriately in this book, world being. So that design becomes the being of the world. And I think that's incredibly significant because I think that we are creatures of the earth as opposed to the space beings that a lot of new agers have us being, that we, our reincarnation is into the earth. Our energy is absorbed by the earth. And, and as such, um, we are of Babylon, who is, you know, our lady and our mother, essentially. So, um, the book of the law ends with, the book of the law is written and concealed, Alm Ha. And I think that's part of what that brings to me is what I've just mentioned. So that Liber Al itself becomes a document that is phenomenal. Um, phenomenon reveals itself to the mind and is concealed by the mind. 
So, um, we must say then that the word, the ending of the words, is the word avahadabra. Uh, the word as logos, and that's the uh, Greek term for word, and important for those that have studied the book of John in the New Testament, and for others that have gone deeper into Gnostic scripture, um, and of course, in John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Logos is essentially being in itself. And we might then uh, me say uh, that that's an equivalent of design. Um, the Word is that which is before, or the Logos, I should say, is, is that which is before um being is expressed, so it's pre-verbal, really. And, and Heidegger goes through some effort to talk about logos in that regard and to get to the original Greek meaning of the word before our modern misinterpretations of the New Testament come into place. So, um, in this apprehension of the world, because of the world, the phenomenon, the objects of the world, and the phenomenon of the world itself, um, goes through a cycle of appearance and disappearance, okay? And uh, it, it's through that that we get our apprehension of the world. So, you know, I appear in the, on the world stage today, but I will be dead tomorrow, and I will have disappeared. Perhaps I may be remembered in history, and so I will find some grade of immortality through that, uh, assuming that I belong to, say, an empire like the United States that will be remembered for a very long time, and that's assuming that this country yet has some longevity. Um, we're still, we still have only existed maybe you know, a quarter of the, the uh, amount of time that the Roman Empire existed and, and much less than the Egyptian Empire. Um, however, we inhabit the world not by confronting objects as a subject. In other words, one of the things that happens in phenomenal uh, metaphysics or phenomenology is that the individual is considered the subject and whatever the individual is uh, apprehending, that's the object. And indeed, if you listen to our Rosicrucian Mass uh, directly, you'll see that at one point we say, see the world, um, and, and to understand those objects, you know, um, as the subject projecting out onto the object, not as the object projecting into the subject. There's no way to know that object in that way because I cannot know it in itself. But I must, to, to even hope to bridge that gap, to know that object, whether that object is a person, even my own person as an object compared to the subject of the innermost me. But to know any particular person as an object, I have to uh, approach that person as a subject and know through my own intuition and check the, the intuition line in our four yard, Doctrine of the Four Yards in our Rosicrucian Mass. Uh, for more on that. Um, so, we inhabit the world not by confronting objects as a subject, and I'm talking about inhabiting the world, not necessarily perceiving the objects, which I just got talk, uh, which I just got done talking about, but by pursuing um, ends. Uh, participating in practices, occupying social roles, establishing identities, and creating meaning in history. So in other words, I'll repeat that. We inhabit the world not by confronting objects as a subject. We inhabit the world by pursuing ends. Those ends are our goals, the things we need to do. I'm going to uh, pursue this career. I'm going to pursue that family. I'm going to buy that house. I'm going to live over here. I'm going to shop here, etc., etc. By pursuing ends, participating in practices, those things. I'm going to become a, a study chess and become a chess player. I'm going to play golf on Saturday afternoons. These are practices, you know, and we can get to more uh, enervating practices like the arts or illuminating practices like Gnostic and mystical studies, but 
certainly uh, also occupying social roles, establishing identities, creating meaning for ourselves. And that's all that that's about. And in that creating meaning, we're creating meaning in history. Okay. So this is the end point of our spiritual nature, the end of the words where the logos ends and uh, actual life begins, abrahadabra. So that's really, um, you know, I think Heidegger helps us to see that, um, that Abrahadabra isn't just some really neat magical word that we could do gematria and, and some Tamora and the Terracon with and, you know, play around Kabbalistically till we get to this whole meaningful level of nonsense. Um, and that's not to say that even Crowley's playing with the word was nonsense, but um, uh, that the end point is, is, in our spiritual nature, and that is in what we do. Now, ontology, the study of being, is only possible as phenomenology. So, in other words, understanding phenomena, phenomena is the way that we study being. Okay? Um, and that um, being that we study is uh, has this horizon, time. Time is the horizon of being, and this is definitely, when Heidegger says this, this is definitely a reference to Kant's a priori, okay? Um, in his Transcendental Logic, Kant says uh, the mind that projects the world, and that's what he notes, that we're projecting space-time. Space-time in itself does not actually exist except but the human mind, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when I do my last two programs in this series, which will be on Kant's... Um, uh, uh, Kant's... Uh, uh, <laughs> Critique of Pure Logic. <laughs> Couldn't remember the title. Um, so being is transcendent of any particular entity or entities that can be classified in terms of genus, species, and the like. It cannot be conceived as an entity. Being is transcendent, I'll say that again, being is transcendent of any particular entity or entities. This is design. Okay, design is um, being as ineffable spirit, which is the way that Hegel talks about it, who um, is uh, at least as essential in, in understanding Kant as anyone could be. Um, and so, therefore, entities themselves, Heidegger uh, generates his own term. He says entities themselves are ontic. Remember, ontology is the study of being, and entities are ontic, which I guess we could say that ontic means a part of that study of being. Um, and ontology itself, being a, a, is ontological, uh, uh, ontology describes the emergence of the logos, of essence. And here, uh, Heidegger goes on to further uh, define logos, at least in terms of his own philosophical uh, um, rationale. Heidegger goes on to say, being is not evolutionary. And I think that's important to understand uh, because we, especially in metaphysics or Thelemic metaphysics, uh, and anyone concerned with um, uh, reincarnation, is, is that, you know, we are trying to evolve from lesser beings to greater beings. Indeed, that is the whole Darwinian idea to a point that we evolve up through a series of lifetimes to become greater and greater, more sophisticated, complicated beings, and then ultimately to become spiritual beings. But I think in terms of, of, of Hegel, there is a teleological nature that comes into that design, that comes into the earth, that is, shall we say, Kabbalistically, uh, the uh, All-Father, the elder, the All-Father that was awakened by the daughter having taken the throne of the mother. So that, um, and 
you could go into even my articles on uh, my blog where I talk about the Adam Kadmon and the fact that this divine being eventually takes on substance until it becomes humanity. Thus, we are all gods. And um, the Adam Kadmon being that midpoint that's still mostly spirit but beginning to take on substance again um so that what we are is being everything we talk about everything toward which we comport ourselves how we are in being everything we have in view uh so that again being in the world is a design. It is historiological. It is intimately connected with history. We are design being in the world, but that's a beingness that is not necessarily um, me as an individual. Hence that teleological input of the divine, say, from the stars. You know, that being of the stars and two. Again, a reference to the Adam Kadmon uh, and why the Book of the Law is concerned with that because the Adam Kadmon is that one spirit still kind of split off as mother and father becoming male and female in the human race. Or even indeed in animals and plants and, and, and so many other beings. Um, so design itself, the world being, is an entity and is ontic. Um, design is not just an entity among other entities, but defines itself in relation to being. So this world ash wonder tree, uh, if we want to take the Gnostic mass symbolism, this world being, uh, perhaps even we might say... Uh, Babylon herself, um, is being uh, as the Logos before it becomes something actual. It's pre-verbal and hence spiritual. However, you know, Heidegger seems to contradict himself when he also states that design is pre-ontic and ultimately becomes ontological. Um, it's amazing how some of these um, phenomenologists, as they really get into their writings, you can find them sometimes even contradicting themselves in the same sentence. And I think I spoke about that in my last uh, lecture in this series. Um, they're trying to get to a place that words can't express, which is why music and the arts become so significant, because philosophy requires words. It's how it works. Although the mystical sensibility, the apprehension of the logos, that mystical sense, uh, being pre-verbal, is something that we can feel, we can acknowledge, we can sense, and develop a sensibility towards, or of, but as soon as it comes down to words, it loses something. And, and this is why, whether we talk about Libra Allen, especially in terms of like what will seem like some Nazi kind of stuff in the third book, um, this is why you can't take this stuff literal. Why uh, the Bible and the ancient Gnostic scriptures fail so miserably, why the Quran and the Torah fail so misery, miserably is because people try to read them in a fundamental sense, literally. And you got to be careful about that. Um, it's funny because obviously... Um, 2-22-22 just passed, February 22nd, 2022, just passed with all those twos in there. Of course, you saw all the New Agers jumping up and down. Oh, it's going to be a magical day and whatever. It's going to be really good things are happening or really terrible things are going to happen, depending on which New Ager you are listening to. And all of this false numerology. Well, even gematric use, which is, should be reserved primarily for holy books and the study of revealed scripture, um, a lot of this stuff gets popularized into commonplace things that indulges people's fears or appetites or what have you. And anybody can go into scripture and play around with gematria. 
absolutely anybody. And you can come up with anything. You can actually look into scripture and come out of there and say, my toenail will make an excellent salad. You know, just because you can. There's a convoluted way you can go about it. It takes somebody with that sensibility that is the logos to handle gematria in a fine way and not get caught up in the vanity and the fear-mongering and anything else you might connect with populist numerology. Um, we, the Hebrews were at least began to realize that to some degree. They began eventually by the 12th century to stop reading the Torah so literally, at least the, the original Kabbalists. And they began to look into words numerologically um, inside of their scriptures to find something that enhances those scriptures and helps make those words more meaningful. Uh, the example is given very commonly with Ahiba and Achad, Achad being unity and Ahiba being the word for love, and they both equal 13. Therefore, unity or God is love because each explains the other through the number 13. I'll take that one step further for a minute. 13 is the thrash rack of 31. In other words, the two numbers reversed. And therefore, um, this explains uh, the key to Liber Al. Uh, and so we go back to a, a certain proof that Liber Al is a divine scripture, its key being the number 31. Anyway, um, back to Heidegger, who seems to contradict himself again, as I said, that um, design is pre-ontic and yet ultimately becomes ontological, ultimately becomes a being. Um, this seems to imply something that develops teleologically, as if being to which design relates brings design forth from the human being as we find ourselves in the world. So it's the earth that brings us out of ourselves. I don't know how necessarily to say that, but Heidegger at least is one of those writers, those philosophical writers, that helps uh, prove Nietzsche's point that when a philosopher uh, has to get so wordy and convoluted that he becomes indecipherable, that you know he's just basically bullshitting and um, is not really doing good philosophy. Of course, uh, Nietzsche uh, hated metaphysics, <laughs> and he's connected also, like Jung, with um, uh, Nazism uh, in, in an interesting way. Um, I think Nietzsche would have hated Nazism in every which way, because uh, Nazism, uh, nationalism, uh, the uh, age of the... Um, uh, plutocrats in the age of the tyrants that is emerging and that we are stepping into in the modern world um, is a, a product of the growing nihilism that has been uh, accompanying the modern world uh, and thus that you know that killed God that killed the mythological way we had of identifying ourselves and to connect ourselves um, meaningfully with the world um, and as we've become disconnected, we've become nihilistic, and that's the pursuit of raw power. It's me being right no matter what. And, you know, if I can make a few bucks and, you know, step on a few other people, we'll do that too. That's nihilism, you know, in way too brief a nutshell. Um, uh, so... It seems that Thelema recognizes this whole idea of design emerging from the world um, in its own dialectic. Remember, the three, the, the three books of Liber Al are a dialectic. Point, counterpoint, and transcendent point. Nuit and Hadith being the point and counterpoint, and Rahur Kuit being the transcendent point. Um, so it may be that Heidegger comes close to what Thelema is becoming a development of. And, and I should say, uh, if you read a lot of my writings, uh, I talk an awful lot about Jung, uh, who 
again was connected with Nazi Germany, not that he approved of the Nazis, except that Jung notes when he was in Germany, he was very much a Nazi. This is a Jewish man. Uh, well, I'm sorry, forgive me. Uh, I, he was a Christian, forgive me. I don't know. Um, he started out a Christian. Anyway. I don't know that he ended up that way. That would be arguable. Um, he, when he was in Germany, he got a hold of the zeitgeist, the feeling, the palpable feeling of everybody agreeing. This is mob psychology. This is everybody, you know, you know, in a crowd, all leaning one way. This is the herd mentality of Nietzsche. Hooray for my side. Hooray for my party. Hooray for what I believe in. That all these other people around me also believe in this. But when he left Germany, when he was flying, to say, across the Atlantic to America, even though America was buying into Nazism when it first um, uh, encountered Nazism, Americans loved Hitler in the beginning, and even probably into the war. Uh, they weren't really sure what to do with him. Uh, but again, we have our own nationalist element. So um, that being very, very strong in this country, so you can see why we loved him, even though we don't acknowledge that in our history, the same way we haven't yet really come to terms with acknowledging slavery yet, which is a whole other issue. Um, but when Jung left Germany... He saw how horrific Nazism is. He saw how counter-libertarian it was, uh, all the issues with uh, nationalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is how he developed that term zeitgeist. And I have an article on my blog, I think, called Geist, because that was the first time I've heard of the, or came into this term, German term, Geist, which is kind of a word that means being. Um, and so uh, look for that because I, I give several other uses, uh, uh, other words that have Geist in them uh, uh, and uh, really worth talk, uh, uh, thinking about. And, and I hope you'll enjoy that article. But uh, remember, in, in everything I say about all these philosophers, but even Heidegger now specifically, I'm really working backwards from Thelema into German idealism. I'm not so much teaching German idealism, um, German metaphysics, uh, German phenomenology, as or French existentialism per se. When when I covered Sartre, um, I'm really working. I'm really covering Thelema and working backwards from that point. Um, you may say that that's really kind of a worthless way to go about things. That's uh, your own issue. Um, but as I've mentioned, Heidegger touches the earth uh, only lightly, whereas the Lima is not just in the world, but the world is its substance. So we are um, very different in the approach that the Lima takes. Um, we look at the world as substance um, more than the idea of the world. Um, the idea fails, as all ideas uh, are easily corrupted in the way that all ideologies are corrupted and corruptible. So even the best ideology can sound, start and sound as a wonderful thing um, and uh, can be quickly twisted into becoming the most horrific things. How many people have killed in the name of Christ? There's an ideology for you ideology. Um, we can look at what was going on with Stalin and Hitler at that time in world history. Um, these were ideologies that, in, in a certain sense, you could say this started out great. The, the Nazi ideology was about retur returning and restoring pride to the German people. And look what happened 30 million people later. So, um, Beware of all ideologies, beware of all political parties, get beyond, um, get beyond the person to the logos, and um, discover that mystical sense of being that is, as Nietzsche would have said, beyond good and evil.
So with that, I'll say thanks for listening. I hope that you will enjoy uh, this and hit the like button, etc. And do all those groovy things that help make our YouTube channel thrive. Uh, If you can, please go to our website at GCLVX.org and make a donation. We'd certainly appreciate that effort if you can afford it. Um, We have an historic congregation. We have an historic building um, where we treasure the notion that everyone is a god. And thus, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And love is the law. Love under will.